Hey everyone, finished reading the next issue of Ranger Academy, issue 11. Somehow, Palpatine returned. Not sure what it says about Ranger Academy when the first narrative text on the first page reminds me of an infamous line that became a meme because of how well it put on display sloppy writing. Somehow, Lindy convinced Ryanth to let her take Zelon's device back to the school. He seemed pretty adamant about not letting anyone use it or do anything with it last time. I guess he realized he has no reason to not at least try. Everyone gets in the ship and immediately we're at the school. This comic is both too slow and too abrupt. The school has been overtaken by Dark Spectre because after all the bluster the school made about how dangerous he was, they apparently did absolutely nothing when Sage and Tula said they saw him in the holodeck thing, whatever. The Headmaster is possessed by Dark Spectre, and I think this is the most active role the Headmaster's had in the entire series. She just hasn't been around, and the few times that she is, she makes little impression. I think this is intended to be a shocking moment, but it doesn't work. I don't care about the Headmaster, and it's not even a stretch that she's evil now. She tried to cover up the Green Rangers existed, for no reason. She was either active or complacent in the alteration of history, that's pretty bad. Lindy figures out that Dark Spectre is only controlling the Headmaster, not the school itself. Okay. Her reasoning is that Dark Spectre can't hurt them, or else that he would have by now. Tula then drops some pretty important info. They can't morph while the Headmaster is possessed because she's connected to everything. So the Headmaster is part of the Morphin Grid itself or something? So what's stopping Dark Spectre from just infecting the entire grid and possessing any currently morphed rangers? Nika appears and leads everyone to a safe room that conveniently exists now, I guess. They then go to Nika's underground caverns. Remember those? Weren't those, like, really important? Theo, Carter, and Maeve are there. Maeve is the girl with the short red hair. I don't think she's gotten a name until this moment. Down in the caverns, they make a plan. Zelon's device apparently has some pretty convoluted rules to use. After activating it, you have to morph. Morphing is what allows Dark Spectre to possess people, so it's a dangerous thing to try. Ryanth says he'll do it. He morphs, and we see his generation of rangers also had the uber-lame morph call, Power Up, Power On, Power Rangers. Wait a minute, if he's the one who agreed to use the device, why does he morph now? Didn't Lindy say you had to morph it? Whatever. The others distract a couple of possessed students and teachers so Ryanth can get to Dark Spectre. Mathis morphs to defend Tula at one point, and Tula yells at them for taking such a risk. Lindy tries to activate the device, even though I thought Ryanth was the one who was supposed to do the whatever. It won't work. A piece is missing. We then see the missing piece in the hands of Mathis, now possessed by Dark Spectre. One more issue to go, and I have no idea how everything in this comic is going to wrap up. I'm assuming it just won't. I'm wondering if this is going to end like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Return. That comic ended on a cliffhanger, and it seemed like there was never any intention to clear up all the mysteries. The thing I've been thinking about the most is Nadira's husband being missing. Whoever it is, uh, Lucas or Joe, it was just a subtle offhand mention, and I wouldn't be surprised if most people reading this forgot about it. One bit in this comic I genuinely like is where our cast is on the ship to the school. Sage tells Ryanth about going to prom. He's shocked at first, thinking she wore a dress, but she tells him, no, a friend lent me a tux. It's a really nice uh, bit of character interaction, and feels more natural than a lot of the other instances in the series. This does reveal a big issue in the series, though. Nothing has happened. I'm being hyperbolic. Stuff has happened. It's just been very slow. In 11 issues, Sage has stowed away to a magic school, earned a morpher, and now Dark Spectre has taken over the school. Compared to other Boom Comics series, relatively little has occurred. The first miniseries was Pink, focusing around Kimberly. It loosely tied in with the main series, but focused mainly on Kim and Trini reuniting and rescuing people from some reptile monsters, or whatever those were, and gaining new powers from Zordon. It was six issues, and each issue contained about the same narrative content as every single of Ranger Academy combined so far. Even Power Rangers Universe, a miniseries about the team who would become the Morphin Masters, I think was handled slightly better than Ranger Academy. The universe was convoluted and relied far too much on extensive lore, and rarely featured the actual characters being characters, making it hard to empathize with them. If the universe had 12 issues to tell its story, I think it may have benefited. That story had a cast of diverse, unique characters, and I'd love to be able to learn more about them. 
Unfortunately, that series rushed way too much and seems to have been forgotten by most fans, in part because it was so confusing and the characters were forgettable. Ranger Academy, I feel squandered its chance opportunity. It's the first Boom Power Rangers comic to go beyond six issues and be its own story disconnected from anything else. It spent the first half of its run building up some convoluted conspiracy around Green Rangers being forbidden and erased only to then flip and forget that in favor of Dark Spectre sometimes being considered a threat. Especially odd, since the school is clearly intended to be Terra Venture crashed on the moon of Miranoi, by which point in time Dark Spectre was dead. I want to talk about Nika, but there's nothing to say. He's been pretty pointless. I thought he'd be a source of information for Sage that she otherwise wouldn't be able to obtain, but nah, he's just some guy. Mathis is an idiot and gets possessed by Dark Spectre. Well, I guess my expectations were subverted there. I thought one of our main cast would have been revealed to have been Dark Spectre all along. I definitely didn't think somebody would get possessed because they were being an idiot. I mean, yeah, they try to portray it as if Mathis didn't have a choice and had to act fast to protect Tula. It doesn't come across in the art well. More focus should have gone to Tula being in a desperate situation and Mathis is held back or overpowered, building up some tension before they finally decide morphing is worth the risk. Instead, it's barely a flash in a few panels. That, this reminds me, why is morphing what enables Dark Spectre to possess people? I know they said it's because he infected one person or another with a connection to the Morphin Grid and was thus able to spread who he could possess, but how? How does this work? Last issue revealed he possessed Sage as a baby. Did baby Sage morph or have the ability to morph or have, like, some connection to the Morphin Grid as a baby who'd never morphed? What about the Headmaster? They're just a holographic head. Do they even have the ability to morph? Hey, what about that big bald sage head we saw back when she snuck into the green campus? I thought that implied each campus had their own big floating head projections, and that this was like sage from the future projecting herself, but... Or is that supposed to be one of the things we aren't supposed to remember, like the ever-changing security footage from the last few issues? Oh hey, remember that thing about Lindy losing her family? I'm guessing it never comes up. Oh, or maybe Dark Spectre is her dad. Would that make her related to Malagor? Does Malagor even exist in this continuity? Oh, hey, I just remembered. Malagor could possess people, kinda. Or at least that pit he climbed out of had mysterious qualities that were able to turn Jason and Kimberly evil briefly. Is that where this whole possession thing came from? A thing a completely different character may or may not have even been capable of? Like, yeah, my personal fan theory is that Malagor and Dark Spectre are a part of the same species, and Malagor is either too young to know how to speak, or he's been too isolated, buried in a volcano and all. Oh, hey, remember when Green Rangers were some mythical forbidden thing? I think they... they bring up Orange Rangers, too. I have no idea when this comic is taking place, but shouldn't they be aware of Fern from Cosmic Fury? Does Cosmic Fury just not exist in this continuity? If not, why? Hyperforce possibly takes place, if we're to believe Joe was Nadira's husband. Did they have an orange ranger? I know they did some weird things in that show. Why haven't any rangers come to help yet? Ranger Academy can contact rangers across time and space. Why can't some rangers with specific abilities or powers come to help? Dark Spectre can possess someone if they morph, so... Bring in a ranger who doesn't have to morph, like, I don't know, Rex Ranger? Hey, if friggin' Hyperforce can be canon, then so can mission training, damn it. How about rangers who are just always morphed, like Phantom Ranger? Surely there must be some out there. What about all the former students of Ranger Academy? There must be hundreds out there by now. Like, at least a few of them must have been, like, already morphed and got the message to, like, okay, don't demorph and then morph again. Just come on down and help or something. What about Blue Centurion or Space Patrol Delta? We see Doggy Kruger earlier in the comic and he's even in person. So what's stopping them from assisting? Bring Birdie and Cat or something. And what about Cat's temporary morpher? Does that, like, have the same, like, uh, risk of getting possessed by Dark Spectre? This comic's biggest problem, above the sloppy writing and bland characters, is that it seems to forget it's supposed to be a Power Rangers comic. Nothing about this comic feels like Power Rangers. That's not a fundamentally bad thing. Turning the premise on its head has worked before. Lost Galaxy felt like a big departure from what had come before, feeling more like a space opera than a typical Monster of the Week superhero show. RPM also breaks the mold, feeling more like a modern drama at times. Hell, if Hyperforce is indeed part of this comic, 
it's probably the farthest you can get from feeling like Power Rangers. Ranger Academy fails to take advantage of the world it's in. I get that they wanted to hold off on cameos and guests and references to continuity, but I think utilizing characters and situations where they'd fit would not only be cool for fans, but help introduce the wider world to non-fans or younger readers. I brought it up in another video. Gokaiger does exactly this while remaining accessible to people not entrenched in the knowledge of the franchise. I think... Ranger Academy should have had a fan or two, as consultants at least, there to give suggestions like, okay, we have a ranger who can show up in this issue, who would fit the situation, who has abilities or some kind of experience that would enhance the experience and would enhance the story. And a while ago, they had Katie from Time Force show up, and she doesn't really serve any kind of purpose. She's just there, standing there. She doesn't really accomplish anything that any other given ranger couldn't have done. So yeah, Ranger Academy stinks. I didn't care for it, and I think I'm just about done with Boom's Power Ranger comics. The Usagi Ojimbo team-up, it was kind of the last straw. I've decided not to talk about it, except for this one instance here. For whatever reason, the team that teams up with Usagi Ojimbo, a samurai, is Mighty Morphin instead of... Samurai... And every review I've read of it said, yeah, Samurai would have made sense, and that's the obvious choice, but Mighty Morphin is what sells. So I decided, okay, I guess I won't buy it. I won't give them my money, because this is a stupid idea. Vote with your wallets, people. The one Power Ranger comic from Boom that I am kind of looking forward to is an upcoming anthology comic with stories written by some actors who've taken part in the show at one point or another, and that sounds kind of interesting. An anthology comic is exactly what I've wanted from Power Rangers from the beginning. I'm surprised Boom hasn't gone more into doing anthology comics. So far, the closest they've done is a few of the annuals and anniversary things, and that's it. It's so weird to me, because Power Rangers has such an enormous world, with fans of every season, but... They're only catering to an extremely specific portion of that fan base. It's either, like, actually, like, I like Mighty Morphin. I love Mighty Morphin, but the version of Mighty Morphin they have in the comics isn't Mighty Morphin the show. It's their own interpretation of Mighty Morphin. The Mighty Morphin team that shows up in Godzilla vs. Power Rangers or the Ninja Turtles comics, those aren't the Mighty Morphin Rangers I know. So I don't really connect with them. Back to Ranger Academy, I'm not expecting to get answers or even a satisfying ending to Ranger Academy in the next and final issue, but I am thinking of doing my own rewrite after it's all done because I have some ideas that I think would work really well, one of the big ones being a heavier tie-in with SPD, which I'm kind of surprised Ranger Academy didn't do considering SPD is pretty popular. If you were to rank all the Power Ranger seasons, especially among casual fans, SPD would probably be pretty high up there. Like, at one point in time, I think SPD was probably more popular than any other season. And also, with, like, 2025 coming up, we have the 20th anniversary of SPD coming up, this would be a cool way to tie into that and acknowledge that. Yeah, I don't think they will. So yeah, that's it for this one. Hope you enjoyed it. So yeah.